Okay, you're welcome back. Just before we go to the papers to bring you the um, what the headlines are, uh, and, and we're going to be joined, uh, hopefully, by Tunde Kolawole, who is a legal practitioner here in Lagos State, would like to inform you that the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has set uh, the dates for elections in both Ondo State and Edo State. Uh, it said that... Um, uh, a do governorship election will be held on September 21, 2024, while that of Ondo State will be held on November 16, uh, 2024. Uh, that's what uh, the, uh, it, it has said. And uh, remember that the um, Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which they quoted as giving the, having the provisions, said that um, you cannot hold the election earlier than 150 days before uh, the end of the tenure of the incumbent. So it has to be 150 days or less uh, to the end of the tenure. But it cannot be later than 30 days to the end of the tenure of the incumbent. So that's why these dates have been set. Remember, also, we have off-season elections in uh, uh, Kogi State and also in uh, Imo State. Uh, those ones will be held in November of this year. So. Uh, we're going to have those offices and elections. But for Edo and Ondo State, uh, you've just had the dates that the uh, elections will be held. So whoever you are, wherever you are, if you are a stakeholder in any of these elections, be informed that these are the dates for the election. September 21, 2024 for Edo State and Ondo State is uh, November 18, 2024. So we go to the headlines now and look at uh, what the headlines are saying, beginning with the Punch newspaper. We're going to reel out all those uh, headlines that are there. And then when Tunde joins us, we're going to begin to x-ray them one after the other as much as we can. So we'll begin with the Punch, like I said. And the Punch newspaper, uh, we kick off with OPS kicks as labor vows to shut down airports others on Tuesday. The riders on that story is a federal government labor leaders meeting holds on Tuesday. Tinubu to unveil workers' package on October 1. Uh, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria and others warn of massive economic losses. Government food dragging on workers' demands, according to NLC. Uh, that is the story. Indefinite strike is the, the story. Okay. We also have, on top of that, Cardoso to clear dollar debt, suspend intervention loans. You know that it has been cleared as the uh, Fed, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria governor, the new governor, Cardoso. He is to clear the dollar debts, uh, suspend intervention loans. Uh, fuel, car, others, imports, gulp $46 billion annually. That's according to the federal government. Uh, Idil Moulud, pray for Nigeria, Tinubu tells Muslims. And by the way, today is a public holiday, and this is the reason. It's Idil Moulud. So, landlord uh, bathes 11-year-old with hot water, and INEC unveils on do edo polls and polls timelines. That's it for Punch. We will move to the Guardian newspaper to see what the Guardian newspaper is also saying this morning. Guardian newspaper. Now, on the Guardian newspaper, um, more factories, businesses may shut down as diesel hits 1,100 naira per liter. Okay, um, that's uh, the, the boldest headline there. Now, Cardoso, how CBN will stabilize naira, slow down inflation? That's another way to put it. So the Central Bank of Nigeria governor is saying how he's going to turn around our fortunes. In search of qualified teachers for basic secondary education is a news analysis that you may want to read. NLC TUC close ranks to begin indefinite strike October 3. And police arrest three Adamawa monarchs, counselor, for selling palliatives. <laughs> palliatives and the palliatives were hala. Renewed insecurity killings threaten Guba polls in Imo State. Then IPOP flees history book labeling Ndibo as invaders, troublemakers. Okay, 
I remember also that uh, there was the, the, the thing of no victory or no victor, no vanquished after the Civil War. And uh, now this is coming up. So if a history book is having uh, that they are the invaders, I don't know how we can marry the two together. So we go to the Nation newspaper. Uh, Nation newspaper is next after the Guardian. Um, on the Nation newspaper, the boldest head headline on the Nation newspaper is how I will tackle inflation Naira Forex Crisis by Cardoso. Uh, CBN Governor, transparency, compliance to rules will be upheld. Okay, we will watch and see. We also have other smaller stories. Obaseki asks Shoebu to drop governorship ambition. Tinubu okays purchase of 12 attack helicopters. Um, we also have Army Aviation gets boost. Okay, now we, we also have a story, OPS, PICA, others oppose labor strike uh, call, NLCTUC fix October 3 uh, for indefinite strike. Uh, that is what um, you also have uh, an interest, interesting list there, CBN governors from uh, 1958 to date. So you might want to see that if you're a lover of history. INEC fixes dates for a do on do governorship elections. Okay, uh, those were the headlines. We also have some headlines from uh, Nature News. But before we go into that, let's just welcome our guests for this morning. Uh, we're glad to be joined by Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Tunde, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning, my brother. Thank you for having me. Mm, it's always a pleasure to have you. Okay. Um, Let's begin with uh, the Punch newspaper, where uh, the Labour is saying that they will go for, to, for this indefinite strike, and OPS is kicking against uh, this, um, uh, this vow of Labour, for instance, to shut down airports orders on Tuesday. And Labour is accusing the federal government of dragging their feet and so many other things under that headline. So what are your thoughts on this strike, this proposed strike? that will come up uh, even on the day that they are scheduled to have a meeting with the federal government? Honestly speaking, I am frightened by the decision of labor to embark on strike. Why am I frightened? I'm, fri I'm frightened because the economy is already comatose. And if an already comatose economy is again visited with a strike, you and I can imagine the specter of what we are likely to see. Just this morning you have read reports coming from the chambers of commerce saying that so many industries, so many companies will most likely close down because the cost of diesel, the purchasing price has continued to rise. When you had that, so the challenges that we have with regard to the valuation of the Naira or the value of the Naira, the scenario is better imagined. Honestly speaking, in order not to sink the entire Nigerian economy, I would have preferred that maybe labor do the kind of thing that uh, the ASU people used to do. Get experts together from the academia, from the industry, and draw a blueprint of an economic alternative that the federal government can embark upon to be able to stabilize the Naira, stabilize the economy, guarantee food security. A one strike is already enough. Adding an indefinite strike to it might just as well think the Nigerian economy if care is not taken it will also lead to massive insecurity across board and of course food security that is already in jeopardy will also be further worsened. So the federal government, I'm sorry to say, some of the monetary economic policies, the neoliberal economic policies, the IMF economic policies, 
the Brazilian world economy policy that they have been adopting will most likely not work. And why is it not going to work? It is not going to work because this economy is not producing anything. The only thing we sell in the international market is the crude oil petroleum products. Unfortunately, that is no longer in high demand. So, in the interest of everybody, it might be better for labor to sit down, like I as you used to do, get experts from across board to do a blueprint of alternative economy policies that this administration can embark upon. And it is possible. What passing twice? That means if you pass it and you find out that it is so good, you will want to use it again and not the bad road. Now, ASU has been doing what you are uh, recommending now. Uh, has it really yeah. worked for ASU? Because they are still, they are still no, aggrieved. I don't, so. So. I don't think so. It has never worked. Most times uh, when ASU makes a proposal, the executive arm of government always uh, ignores them because they think they know better than all those egg, egg, uh, egg eggs that we have in the universities. One of the reasons we are making this uh, recommendation is that history may be kind to us, and that history may also be kind to the NLC. If they say, when you were going this way, we told you that was the wrong way to go, and we gave you an alternative path as the gas was to go. So when all those two cars are laid on the table, the executive of government, the federal government will see, the state government will see, the local government will see it. And the ordinary Nigerian people will also see it, that there were alternatives which were ignored. So that when history is assessing and giving marks to all the different uh, categories of people who would have had a hand in the economic crisis that we are facing today, history will know where the blame should appropriately go to. Because, as you said, chances are that whatever proposal that NLC makes an order will most likely be ignored. More importantly, we have begun to see a divide and rule on the part of the government. ASU, TUC, NLC are no longer speaking with the same voice. Whereas organizations like the TUC and the NLC ordinarily should be speaking with one voice. They may not be speaking with one voice because the government is creating a wedge between these organizations. Okay, you talked about the economic policies that uh, you are afraid may not work. And we are also seeing yeah. the new CBN governor, Cardoso, who is saying that he's going to clear dollar debts and he will suspend intervention loans. Uh, how will that work out for us? Well, for me, I support the suspension of the so-called intervention loan. Like I have said, it is anathema. It's, uh, so to say, an impossibility that the federal government will say it is borrowing the state governments and the local government money to be able to intervene in the economic crisis that their people are facing. Whatever money comes or, are, or becomes accruable to the consolidated revenue account of the country belong to all the three styles of government. Or if you like, you can add the judiciary to it, which has to be shared in the proportion which the constitution as I said, it should be shared. So, where the federal government is getting this idea that is borrowing the state and the local government money, instead of saying that whatever, or saying this total amount of money has become a cool So, the federation account, they will share it in the formula in which the losses will be shared. He would advise that you use some of this money 
if not all the money to alleviate and cushion the effect of the withdrawal subsidy on the petroleum products. That is the way it should go. With the CBN governor, I don't see where he's going to get the money to really offset or pay off all the local debts and all the foreign debts that the nation is currently swimming in. Like we have always said, Nigeria is a mono economy with very thin productive base. So if you are not producing anything and selling locally and internationally, how will you earn money to be able to pay the local and foreign debts that we are owing? The alternative to that would be to resort to the ways and means which the Buhari administration was using heavily in order to power some of the infrastructural developments or programs that that government embarked upon. And what is ways and means? It's mere paper money. You merely have the meeting corporate and the CPN to print money. And then you begin to, to spend it. And any nation that begins to do that, of course, other countries of the world that are producing, whose citizens sweat to be able to earn money, will not fold their arm and allow you to be cheated on others or the world economy or for their own citizens to be subsidizing the living conditions of your own people. So, the CBN governor, if he's going to turn things around, I have a feeling it will require not less than between six months and one year to be able to do it. And one of the ways this could be done is to look at the area of the blue marine and blue economy, the ministry which the federal government has created. A lot of money could be earned in there. A lot of things can be tapped into, which are currently not doing. So the federal government will require to look for very honest people to secure that sector, especially the import and export, the airports, and then some of these other revenue generating areas. If Cardoso is able to persuade the federal government to block all the leakages at the ports in the seaport and through the borders, and of course, we are not able to know the quantity of uh, crude petrol that we produce every day and stop illegal siphoning of those products and selling them internationally. And we also are able to block all the dirty things that are alleged that are, that are alleged to be taking place in that sector. Chances are Cardoso might be able to raise money to be able to do some of the things that he wants to do. But if he doesn't go that way, and with the kind of people that he's working with, I doubt it whether he will have the courage or whether they will allow him to embark on that road. Because embarking on that road will mean stepping on the toes of so many people. The people I see now in government are not people who commit class suicide, who will just within 24 hours turn around and begin to or decision some of the things they used to do and begin to run the economy in the interest of the average Nigerian person. Okay, um, well, in spite of everything that we're talking about right now, we also know that um, our, our president has been globetrotting uh, in the past uh, few months after he was sworn in as president, asking people to come and do business in Nigeria. He used the opportunity of ONGA to do that. Uh, every other opportunity that he has had, he has spoken to the international community to come and do business in Nigeria. But if you go to the Guardian newspaper now, the screaming headline there is that more factories, businesses may shut down as diesel hits 1,100 naira per dollar or per liter, sorry, for diesel. 
And I don't know. And we, well, even though it was a mistake I made per dollar, we know that the dollar right now is 1,100 naira in some places, and in others, 1,000 naira. And even in the Ian uh, eye window, it is also really, really high. How can you woo investors to come into a country whose uh, uh, little industries are folding up already? Yeah, it's a very tall economic uh, uh, policy, which uh, when you look at critically, it will be difficult to realize. As Mr. President is junketing around the world and soliciting for investment, some countries of the world are also warning their citizens to stay away from Nigeria, especially from the northern part of the country, the southeast and the south south. And you and I will know that it wouldn't be just the US that are issued such one. Britain has in the past done so. UAE has withdrawn from Nigeria and stopped giving this out to our people. And then uh, some of the happenstances taking place in the West African sub region, especially the airport of region, is also, is also hurting the Nigerian economy. Say, for example, the embargoes and uh, some of these other things that we have imposed on Niger, Burkina Faso, and some of those other places that uh, a coup d'etat have taken place. The economies have been short. And the economy of most of those countries revolve around the Nigerian economy. So if Nigerian businessmen are unable to do business in some of those places, it will have sooner than later, or it is already having a very serious impact, a very negative impact on the Nigerian economy. I would rather want to see Mr. President, just like I said, consolidate first at home before venturing outside to begin to ask for investment until you're able to guarantee security, stabilize the Naira, and also come out with very clear economic policies that the whole world can look at, assess, and give a pass mark. They will most likely not come here to invest their money. I must also not forget, Nigeria is not the only country that, solicit, that is soliciting for investment. In fact, some of these other countries have better advantages than Nigeria. Critical example is South Africa and also Ethiopia and all that. Look at the BRICS. Just recently, they held their meeting and invited Ethiopia, Egypt to come and join BRICS when Nigeria is said to be the largest economy in Africa. Before then, they had incorporated South Africa into brief. One of the reasons, or some of the reasons they are not inviting Nigeria is because the economic indices that would encourage that kind of invitation does not exist in Nigeria. So, I will want to repeat what I've always said. Let Mr. President concentrate on solving the problem in the energy sector. Let him also just uh, devote more energy into maintaining existing infrastructure, reining in security, and also ensure that the farmers are able to go back to their farm. If he's able to do this, the economy will begin to bounce back. And this too will be very, very kind to me. Yeah, well, it's, it's becoming an insult to be a Nigerian. I heard the other day there was news that Ghana was offering to provide electricity to Nigeria. Uh, yeah, it's, it was a shame to me, whether they were joking or not joking, but it was a big shame to me that Nigeria will be producing less than 5,000 megawatts for a country of over 200 million. 
Yeah. We have been producing less than 5,000 megawatts for more than 60 years. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. And in spite of all the billions that have gone in there. We keep asking, is it that the leaders do not know or they just do not care? Because even if we want to go all, uh, have alternatives, solar power uh, or wind or anything, we have that in abundance. Why are we not able to do this? Why are we not able to even have a refinery for crying out loud? Uh, this is Nigeria that had so much money we didn't know how to spend. That was the, the slogan of one of our leaders. And now we are so poor mm -hmm. that uh, we'll be going cap in hand to every every country and comparing ourselves to Rwanda, which is a small nation that just experienced genocide mm -hmm. in, in, in the 90s. Well, uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, let's go political now. Um, what okay. is happening in Ondo and Edo states? Let's begin with uh, Edo state. Edo state governor has said that his deputy should drop the governorship ambition. That is, Obaseki has asked Shuaibu to drop governorship ambition. So uh, that is on the Nation newspaper. Uh, as we move to the Nation newspaper, that's the first headline that I'd like us to look at because the, the biggest headline there is how I will tackle inflation, Naira, Forex crisis, that is Cardoso. We've already talked about the central bank governor. So let's go to uh, Do State. The deputy governor wants to be governor after this governor, and it didn't go down well. It's not going down well with the governor. Uh, that seems to be the bone of contention. He's been sacked from uh, government quarters. He's been sacked from a lot of places. Things have been taken away from him. And now he's just telling him, if you want to uh, be in my good books, drop your ambition. Is that still a democracy we are, we are talking about? <laughs> it is not. Honestly speaking, when you hear and see what some of these governors do, you begin to marvel how we have gotten to this level in terms of the arrogance with which the governors have behaved, the messianic role that most of them try to play all the time. Just like you yourself have rightly identified, it is left to the voters in those states to determine who will become the next governor after Mr. Baseki. And not Mr. Baseki can pick anybody and impose it on the party and eventually impose it on the educated people. The situation in which it is individuals that can pick those who could occupy an elective office is no longer a democracy. In my humble opinion, it is not fair for the governor to begin to pester the deputy or his deputy to abandon or dish or decision his uh, governorship ambition. That is not fair. The only right that the governor has is not to support the man in his governorship ambition. Mm -hmm. When Mr. Shaw Mole also didn't want Obaseki to go for a second term, we saw how Mr. Baseki fought tooth and nail to ensure that he cleaned the, the governorship position, that he returned to power. So if he himself has been a victim of the high-handedness of the godfather, why is he playing the same role? Why is he behaving the same way? That is totally not fair. With regard to what is happening in those states, I'm sorry to say, I am shocked by what uh, Mr. Kere Dolu is doing or the impeachment proposal against the deputy governor. Like I've always said, I suspect that the deputy governor is a victim of blackmail and propaganda. I suspect that the deputy governor is a victim of some under ambitious persons who don't want him to succeed, Mr. Kere come the 2024 election. And you will recollect, I mentioned the example of what happened between President Buhari and Vice President uh, Oshimbato when the president went abroad for treatment for about six months. 
before he came back, there were all sorts of insinuations, all sorts of blackmail propaganda that Oshimbajo was trying to torpedo, or was trying to take over the post of uh, the president. And that some of the policies that he had embarked upon will most likely consign the president of President Buhari to the dustbin of history. And so as soon as the president came back, he released his vice president on most of the posts or most of the things that he's used to do. That is what is what that is what appears to be happening in Ondo State today. But with the quality of education of Mr. Kere Dolu, with his exposure, I think he should have been able to lead him between the lines and not begin to embark on this kind of very vindictive uh, uh, action against his uh, deputy. In fact, if there's anybody that should be impeached, it is Mr. Kere Dolu that should be impeached. But when you look at the picture, when you look at it being marooned in the bottom, and not in the uh, Akure Dondo State uh, capital, where you ordinarily should be domiciled, you begin to say that the man may not, may not have the wherewithal in terms of health wise to be able to run the state. So, what we are maybe having is a lame duck governor that subordinates will be running government for until another election is done and the winner sworn in in Nondo State. Remember, in a place like Cameroon, a ninety year old Cameroonian president, Bia, permanently lives in France because of the health challenges that he's facing. And he has been running France. I mean, he has been running Cameroon from France. How is that possible? <laughs> it means I'll be taking files. It's terrible. So in the bottom. Furthermore, with the state of health, will it be able to be inspecting projects uh, all over the state where there is a need to do so? Will it be able to be going to Abuja to attend the federal executive meeting? Will it be able to be convening the state executive meeting, which ordinarily should be held once a week? For God's sake, let's behave like civilized people. In some other countries of the world, when political office holders, when their children, when their wives, and not even themselves, are ill or not uh, in good health, such persons will resign and say, look, I want to take, I mean, I want to resign and go and attend with the failing health of my wife, to the failing health of my son, to the failing health of my daughter, or to the failing health of my relation. I think I will be losing concentration. I may not be able to give this judge the 100% that it deserves. So I'm stepping aside. Not here in Nigeria. We saw Yaradwa dying, and he clinged on to power until the very last minute. For sake. Power is a temporary thing. Sooner than later, you are separated from it by the number of years they expect you to stay, or you are impeached, or even death, like he did the other one. Separate the man who covers power so much from such power. What is happening in those states? What is happening in uh, those states? Are not a divine at all and are sending wrong signals to the whole world. Remember that we have most, I mean, we have most of the embassies, I mean, all the embassies. Most of the countries of the world have their embassies in Nigeria, and they are seen and reading these things. I recollect that they be sending notes and memos back home as we get our behavior our desperation for power. Now we continue to cling into power, while we continue to ride dead horses instead of not turning a living one. All right. Um, well, even though it's not part of the headlines today, but what is also happening in Ogun State may, might just need some mention. 
You know, a local government chairman accused the governor of uh, misappropriation or not giving the, uh, the, the amount of money that was due for the local government and all that. Now he's been removed. He's uh, somewhere in jail or something. And uh, people the are, police are running after him. Yes. So, so how can we hold our elected officers accountable when, when the people at the helm of affairs have absolute power to do and undo? Nobody talked about the allegations, whether they were true or untrue. Nobody investigated if just intimidation, House of Assembly is after the, the man, uh, police after the man and everything. Our democracy, are we really running democracy? Well, maybe you've already answered that question. But let's move to uh, Nature News, where we have um, uh, some headlines here. One of the headlines is that CBN will partner IMF on climate change impacts uh, mitigation through fiscal policies and I'm sure that will culminate in uh, taking loans or taking aid from IMF and all that because when you say partner with IMF or any international body what comes to mind is the kind of money or aid that they will be looking for uh, from these people. I'd like your uh, comment on our struggle uh, for to fight against this uh, uh, climate change in our country. Remember that we had like one of the biggest uh, forests in Nigeria here that what the world was giving us some money for. Uh, in Cross River, at least, we had that kind of a forest. We also have the Cross River gorillas, endangered species that are only in Cross River in the entire world, and so many other things. But are we deliberate enough with our policies back home without it? First of all, partnering with IMF, are we deliberate at all with our policies uh, to mitigate uh, the impacts of uh, climate change in Nigeria? Well, it's uh, very, very unfortunate. Uh, there is no doubt about it that a lot is happening in the area of uh, the climate that has been devastating the environment, not just in Nigeria, but around the world. Look at the erosions that are going on in the southeast. Also look at the desertification. Most parts of the north is almost um, uh, uh, engulfed in desert. And of course, not too long ago, we have seen flooding in the middle belt and different parts of, uh, of the country. The southwest itself is not insulated. Places like Ikoi, Banana Island, and some other parts of the country. Once a little rainfall, the whole environment becomes a, a swimming pool of very stagnant waters. These are indices, very graphic indices of the reality of climate change. But unfortunately, we have not been paying attention to the changes in climate. Rather, most times, when funds are allocated for reforestation, when funds are allocated for controlling of erosion, when funds are allocated to fight flooding, those monies are usually embezzled. Remember that a governor in Nigeria, or is it two, have once been convicted, tried, and jailed for investing in ecological uh, uh, funds. So if you have had this experience, I would not encourage the CPM to begin to go in that direction. It would have been better for the CPM to allow the Ministry, the Federal Ministry of Environment and the respective state Ministry of Environment to be charged with the responsibility of uh, fighting whatever challenges that we have in the area of environment. The CBN doesn't have the tool to be able to do anything meaningful in these areas. And the CBN, like we always know, the sole responsibility or the major responsibility of the CBN is to manage the finances of a country and not to begin to embark on capital projects, physical projects, now we have seen the CBN of Nigeria embarked upon in the recent um, uh, times. Also recollect 
that uh, with the quantum of uh, debt, both foreign and local, that the country is presently carrying today, why would the CBN again be borrowing money or be going out to borrow money from the IMF to fight the climate change? Rather, like Mr. President has done in one of the international fora, they should be soliciting for aid from international donors and from the developed economies who are the ones, the worst polluters of the environment, to be able to invest in the challenges that we have with regards to the environment. It wouldn't be a wise decision, in my humble opinion, to begin to borrow money to fight climate changes with the quantum of uh, debt on the nation's head, especially when we have never made inquiries or be able to account for the different money that have been allocated in the past for the afforestation, for fighting desertification, for fighting erosions in the in the southeast, and then for preserving nature, the animals in the forest. At Obudu, in Yankari villages, in Kanji, and some of these other parts of uh, uh, the country. And of course, we must not forget the ecological disaster in the oil producing areas uh, of Nigeria, the Niger Delta. All the years you have been paying this service to the cleaning up of that uh, place. The people can no longer farm, the fishes in the oceans and the rivers can no longer thrive. Gas is being uh, burnt every night, and the environment heated up, and the people living in ovens rather than living in an environment a normal human being should uh, be residing. Let the CBN government concentrate on managing the nation's trade, their debt, making money available to the federal government, the state government, and the local government to fund their projects and pay salaries, then they see the concerted efforts on fighting inflation and not begin to delve into capital and physical projects. Okay, sorry, uh, Tunde, we lost that audio uh, for some time. Uh, there, we went back to the Nation newspaper where there is a headline, a headline that uh, we skipped earlier on. Um, it is said here that uh, the federal government needs 217 billion naira to complete 289 uh, roads. That's on page two of the Nation newspaper. And I'm just wondering how we're going to get that. How long will it take? And now they, <laughs> the Minister of uh, Works uh, is saying the roads, the Minister um, Dave Umai is saying that the roads uh, should be more durable, the roads that should last for longer. At least he has done it in his own state when he was governor in a Bonyi state. If you go there, the quality of roads is superb. The bridges are superb. Everything is superb uh, as far as uh, the works there are concerned. And he's saying that that kind of a thing can be done in, uh, at the federal level. In fact, he said the Abuja-Lagos Highway will cut down the amount of travel from 14 hours to four hours. That's what he said, and he's very confident about that. But right now, the problem is having to raise 217 billion naira. Some people are asking, how can we get it? But also others are saying, if INEC could get 400 billion to do nothing with it, why can't the works uh, ministry have it? What is your take? Well, I have been following the activities of uh of the works minister, David Dumai, and it would appear to me that the man meant well for the country. But again, we must be careful by saying that sometimes, or most times, wishes are not horses. Just like you said, it will require an humongous amount of money to be able to do some of the things that he has said he would like to do. Now, with regards to cutting the traveling from Lagos to Abuja to just near four hours, that is not possible. 
if we go by some laws of the land, you and I will remember that the speed limit on most Nigerian airways is the 100 kilometers per hour. When you look at uh, Lagos or Ibadan, that is uh, about 100 kilometers. That is already one hour. By the time you travel from Ibadan to Akure, you already would have taken some other hours. If we were to be obeying the speed limit, I'm not too sure that uh, four hours to Abuja from Lagos is realistic, except we want to be flying on the roads or driving recklessly or driving at a neck uh, breaking uh, speed. And then there will be no reason to stop over to fuel and, repl and replenish. Now, with regard to building roads with the concrete, I think it is a good way to go. Studies have shown that roads that are built with concrete will not meet, meet any major repair until after 25 years. Even though repairing them when they break down could be more challenging. But we have seen experiences have shown that with the nature of our climate, the torrential rainfalls that we that, that that we have visited in Nigeria, the nature of our soil, the nature of our soil, near use of beauty men to build our roads are proven not to be reliable. It has been proven as a mere waste of money. But when you build these roads, by the time rain falls on them, two, three Yes, and every truck drive on them, the roads break down and they are washed off. Okay. Whereas if you do concrete, like it's been done from the port to the solo, like it's been done from um, along the Bagada Road and Waterville, you find out that the road can be more durable. Okay. And then it allows uh, it to improve the lifespan of the vehicles that drive on these uh, uh, roads. Well, as regards to where you might raise the money uh, Let's wrap that uh, Let's we talked wrap about, mm. I think it is possible. I have always pointed out that the cost of contract in this part of the world is the highest. Okay. Whereas it ought not to be. When you look at the, the input that goes into building roads, which okay. is basically cement. Let's 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 wrap it up here today. And sand and iron. Yeah. Let's let's wrap it up here. Um, well, uh, I'm glad that you have the confidence you can raise the money, and you also buy the idea that it should be concrete. Uh, like I said, I have first-hand uh, experience in uh, Ebonyi State. The roads are really, really good, and if that can be re replicated in the, at the national level, that would be good. As for cutting the time, well, we do not know. But uh, if there are no potholes on our roads, who knows? At 100 uh, kilometers per hour, we will see where that will take us. But let uh, let us have good roads, and he's saying that it will be told, uh, so which means maybe the uh, private uh, public partnership will be uh, at play here. So, well, would like to thank you for being a part of our show this morning, Tunde Kolaole, legal practitioner. Thanks always, for having me. It's always nice to have you on our show. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll go to our first hot topic. Uh, stay with us. <laughs>